And you know that ever since the Lord has entrusted me with this church, nothing in my life is typical. So typically the first Sunday in Advent is hope. But I prayed about hope last week. I prayed about hope last week, not by mistake, but it was the way that I wanted to end. It's the way that the Lord put in my heart to end the series on prayer. Last year at this time, I was filling in. I wasn't the lead pastor at this church. So last year at this time, I only, pray, I only preached one sermon. The rest of the Advent servants, sermons were done by other pastors in this church. So I spent a lot of time in prayer talking to God after that series that I had and saying, what, what is it that you want me to pray about, what that you want me to preach about today? And for those of you who are on any type of social media, this seems like the time of year where other Christians are saying, if you celebrate Christmas, that's no good. How dare you be a Christian and celebrate Christmas? Christmas is a pagan holiday. You should not have a Christmas tree in your sanctuary. And pre-sanctification, i uh, gotten a lot of arguments with people about that. But the one thing that I have to remember is that the gospel doesn't need to be argued. It just needs to be projected. We don't, need, we don't need to argue about things, right? So before I get started, because I have a short series that I'm going to do with this church on the last three, the last three Sundays, I want to retell you guys what I told you a year ago about what my favorite Christmas Bible verse is. And besides Donna, does anybody know what my favorite Christmas this is kind of like one of those um, questions that, uh, you know, they're like, what's your favorite Christmas movie? And some people say Die Hard, and some people are like, that's not a Christmas movie. It's kind of that question. Anybody? So my favorite Christmas verse in the Bible is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gifted us. His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But, so that Bible verse speaks volumes for me at Christmas time. So as I was praying about what to preach today, the Lord put in my mind a couple things. Today, so you got to come the next three Sundays. And I'm going to give you a forewarning. There's a section in my sermon where it says you shouldn't be missing church. Some of you might not like that. That's okay. There's a lot of stuff that I preach about that people don't like, but that's okay. I got to preach what the Lord puts in my heart. I'm not a feel-good preacher. <laughs> I'm not one of those preachers where you leave here saying, oh, I feel great. No, I want you to feel convicted when you leave here. So there's three things that I'm going to preach about in the next three Sundays. Today, I'm going to cover the history of Christmas and what to do with this Christmas history and, and, and how the Spirit works at Christmas time. I won't say anything about this this week. Next week, I am going to preach on the negatives of Christmas. You're like, the negatives of Christmas? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to preach on the negatives of Christmas and why personally, as your lead pastor, as my first Advent season as the lead pastor in this church, why I personally love Christmas. And then on December 17th, I'm going to preach on the peace that we get at Christmas through the Holy Spirit. And then December 24th will be the best because we got the kids doing their, their, uh, their play up here. So 
I'm sure you'll all show up for that one, right? So I got a question for you guys. And this is not a trick question. What happens in 22 days? Come on, guys. What happens in 22 days? I, I saw my brother Clark mouthed back there. He said Christmas. Wasn't a trick question. It's Christmas. 22 days, right? That's weird, huh? This is probably the earliest Christian sermon that you've ever heard. We're barely into the month, and the pastor's already going to talk about Christmas. And the reason for this is that I want to help us. Really, I seriously, I want to help us prepare for this holiday, whether we like it or not. Whether we like it or not, whether we think we should celebrate Christmas or not. I want to help you prepare for this holiday. You see, in the church, there are people who absolutely love this time of year. They just love this time of year. They go out decorating, celebrating the happiness, right, that they feel. It's a joyous time for them. And then others, on the other hand, think that, well, for some reason, you know, um, and, and I've discussed with this with, with certain people. There's certain members in, in my family. You don't know them, so I can talk about them. That criticize for us celebrating Christmas. So for some, I've discussed this with some people, right, and they think, well, it's, an, it's unchristian to even acknowledge this feast. They won't even have a Christmas tree in their house. That's, that's a big no-no. They don't send Christmas cards. They just don't want any part of this. They don't want any part of this holiday. So I'd like to address some of these issues and help us have at least a Christian, not Christmas, but a Christian spirit about Christmas. So let's talk about what you already know, okay? This is something you already know. So we know, for example, that this is not a celebration. Christmas, for example, is not a celebration spoken or even required in the Bible. Although the Bible describes the human birth of Jesus, it doesn't give us any instructions for us to remember or to celebrate his birth with some kind of ceremony, some kind of feast, or some kind of celebration. Absolutely no instructions in the Bible, no inference, nothing that tells us we ought to do something special to remember the birth of Jesus. And if there is, show it to me. Or the professor. As a matter of fact, the only ceremony that underscores birth is baptism. And it is our own birth as Christians that we live out, right? Through the ceremony of baptism. And Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 6, right? We're buried with Christ. We resurrect with Christ, you know? That's the birth that the Bible talks about, our birth in baptism. The only other ceremony that the Bible actually, the New Testament, gives is the Lord's Supper. The communion. Which is a remembrance, not of the birth of Jesus, uh uh-uh, but of the death of Jesus. On our behalf. The death of Jesus, which makes our own birth and rebirth in the waters of baptism actually possible. So Christmas is a religious holiday. It's based on a biblical truth. But it's not a necessary thing. It is not a command or even a suggestion in the Bible. So we know that. 
We understand that. Another thing that we know is that many of the things associated with Christmas have pagan roots or worldly purposes. We know that. We know that. We know that Christmas began to be observed somewhere in the 3rd or 4th century um, A.D. as an initial effort to Christianize the usual pagan winter festivals of the time. The Roman Solus Invicti, that holiday, right, along with the Druid, winter rituals of that time, pagan revelry, and at that time the church wanted to give people a chance to keep their festivals but remove the pagan ideas. And so they introduced Christian ideas in their place. See, they, they kind of kept the time and the festiveness of the holiday, these pagan things, but they infused them with Christian celebration, Christian meaning. So the holiday was turned into a Christ slash celebration. Follow me. I was going to do a slide about this, but I didn't. Christ, Christ, slash celebration. Christmas. The mass, the M-A-S, the M-A-S-S, the mass part, that's the Latin word for celebrate. So it was a Christ celebration. It was a Christ mass. Christmas. God bless. That's it. So the the Druid, right? The Yule log used by the Druids and other trees that were used in pagan ceremonies, well, these were replaced by evergreen trees. You know why? Which actually symbolizes the changelessness of Christ. The evergreen's the same all year round, right? All year round. Well, it represents the changelessness of Christ. Always the same yesterday, always the same today, always the same tomorrow. The evergreen. What better tree, if you wish, to uh, represent him than a tree that just doesn't change from season to season, the evergreen. The practice of offering gifts to the gods in order to hurry the gods into sending the spring weather, uh, to send the spring weather sooner, this practice was changed where people then began to give money or food or fuel, actually, to the poor. Because this honors Christ. Helping the poor, giving gifts to the poor, this was a way of honoring Jesus Christ. And I'm really glad that the Lord brought me this route because I had no idea of anything. And I always tell you guys, every sermon that I do is for me. It's not for you guys. So there's going to be something in here later on that one particular individual is going to think I'm talking about them. I'm not. I love doing that. So there are other vestiges of pagan rites like, you know, wreaths or candles whose pagan roots are long forgotten, having been replaced with Christian symbolism for so many, for so many centuries until this day. So we recognize that even though the celebration of Christmas originally used a pagan date and some type of element, these things were converted to Christian usage. And with time, Christmas has become to be a completely Christian idea with absolutely no reference whatsoever to paganism. So that's some of the things that we know about Christmas, right? The history of the feast and how it evolved into what we have today. 
But I also want to talk about what we feel about Christmas, right? What we feel about Christmas. You see, you know, the one thing that Christians does, it, that Christmas does, it, it, brings, it brings out emotions in people. And at this time, I, I wish there was a way. Is there any way to mute the live? If not, it's not. Uh, because a loved one of mine. And drug abuse and other types of, uh, you know, those type of things. The next thing, other people, you know, they don't recognize Christmas and they reject the holiday altogether because they can't get over the commer commer commercialization of this holiday, right? And the pagan roots of it. They can't get over that part, how it's commercialized and the pagan roots, where it evolved. The idea that a Christian will be involved in something religious that the Bible does not specifically command? This is how they feel about it. And they feel very strongly about this idea. You know, no, 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 no references to Christmas. They tolerate it at best. At best, they tolerate it. But that's how they feel about it. And the next one, right? For most, however, it's a time of gladness. For most of us, it's a time of gladness, right? And family. And peace. It's a special time with special feelings that are not experienced at other times of the year. So let's face it, you know, why is this, why is it that we want snow to fall on Christmas morning? You know, we hate snow. I hate snow. But we still want it to fall on Christmas morning. So then Dave can come and plow our stuff. Right? Wake up Christmas morning, snow on the ground. There's just something special about that. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. So regardless of what group you fit in, right, you know, the happy, happy ones, the sad, sad, sad ones, or the ones that reject it. Regardless of what group you're in, one thing is for sure, Christmas affects us all. Somehow, in one way or another, it affects us all. And so there's a, there's a little bit of history and a little bit about how we feel about Christmas. So my next topic is, so what are we going to do with this Christmas thing that we all experience? You can't avoid it. If you live in the United States, you can't avoid the Christmas holiday. I have reminded you, I have reminded you, right, about some of the things we know and some of the ways that we feel about Christmas. Now I want to share with you some of these things that we ought to do with Christmas. This is the part you might not like, because I believe that what you do at Christmas will affect how you feel at the time of the year. So I have some recommendations. <laughs> They're not commands, right, of any kind. Like I said, there's nothing in the Bible that commands anything about Christmas. But there's, there's some suggestions that I have.
So suggestion number one is, at Christmas time, honor Christ. At Christmas time, honor Christ. I mean, there is still a Lord's Day during the Christmas holiday. So make sure that all of us, that we honor Christ, right? How ironic is it that a man-made celebration honoring Jesus would sometime interfere with a divinely appointed day of honoring Jesus? You get my point here? You see where I'm going? How disappointing it must be to God that the, the disciples of Jesus would not come to church to honor Jesus according to the Bible because they find it too inconvenient to break away from their man-made celebrations of Jesus Christ at Christmas time. Now, as I'm preparing this sermon, the blessing was that I didn't preach this last year when Christmas landed on a Sunday. And people had all the excuses in the world not to come to church that day. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm just preaching. You know, that's, it's, it's, it's weird how it happens. Oh, no time for church. We got Christmas. We got stuff happening at Christmas. I don't have time to come to church. All right, let's, let's get off that topic there. You know, in the Bible, <laughs> it says to us, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Because the day is approaching. The day is approaching. So put it into your minds right now. Early in the month, before it really gets crazy, that you will not insult the Lord by refusing to gather with him around the communion table in order to celebrate him around the dinner table. Oof. Do not insult the Lord by refusing to gather with him around the communion table in order to celebrate him around the dinner table. More important that we celebrate with him around the communion table than we celebrate with him around the dinner table. The first order of business for the Christ celebration or the Christ mass or Christmas is to honor Christ during this time. Is to honor Christ during this time. And certainly a primary way of doing this is to make sure that we make time for worship. Remember last week's sermon when I said that poor girl who was sick, she wasn't even allowed to go worship? So let's keep our priorities straight no matter what time of year it is, okay? And I'll tell you, you know, in the world, there's always a reason not to attend worship service. There's always a reason. Oh, it's too cold outside. It's too hot. It's too rainy. It's too slick. I feel rushed this morning. I got stuff to do. I got to go shopping. I'm late, you know. There's a million reasons to avoid attending worship. At Christmas, at Christmas time, let's not allow the human celebration of Jesus to interfere with the spiritual celebration of Jesus. Let's not do that. Another thing that I recommend, let us keep Christmas Christian. Let's make sure that the spirit of Christmas is equal to the spirit of Christ. See, a lot of people don't celebrate Christmas because it has pagan roots. And you know what? I respect their decision, and I understand their feelings. I do. But I do celebrate it because I believe, note takers, 
Because I believe the essence of Christianity is the power of conversion. I believe that the essence of Christianity is the power of conversion. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators nor adulterers. Nor adulterers. This is my Puerto Rican in me. Sometimes I can't read. Nor homosexuals. Nor sodomites. Nor thieves. Nor covetous. <laughs> nor drunkards. Nor revealers. No extortioner. You know, that verse right there. <laughs> but you were washed. But you were sanctified. Sanctification sermon coming in January for those that want it. Because a lot of us don't know what sanctification is. And that is the core of the church of the Nazarene. Baptized by the Holy Spirit. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. And by the Spirit of our God. See, the wonder of Christ is that he takes someone who is unholy and he makes that person holy by the virtue of his power and his purity and his love and his sacrifice. For God so loved the world. Christianity has done this with the Christmas feast. You see my parallel there? I know it's, it's, it's kind of a hard sermon to follow, but, but it's important. It has taken something that the worldly pagan, the unwholesome, and through the power of truth and love and Christ has transformed it into a universal thing of beauty and delight, representing the very best Ideals of the Christian spirit, which are peace and love. So let's not allow the world to convert Christmas and us back to paganism. Let's not do that. You know, Christmas becomes a pagan feast when we participate along with the pagans. When we participate in drunkenness. You know, I can tell you, some people have their first alcoholic drink as a young boy or a girl at Christmas time. Why? Because it's, come on, it's Christmas. <laughs> it's great, yeah, yeah, you want a beer? You're 14, you want a beer? Sure, sure, okay, Tony, let him have a beer. It's Christmas time. Let them have a drink. Hmm. And there begins a 20-year habit that's hard to break. But where did it start? Christmas time. Because for some crazy reason, people think, hey, it's Christmas. <laughs> God is relaxing. The standards become, the, the, relaxing the standards because it's Christmas time. No. Nah. Nah, 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 nah. Let's not participate along with these pagans in unbridled worldliness. Let's not participate with the pagans in gluttony. Got to put that one in there for myself. In fornication. Let's not do that. You see, the trouble with feast has always been their danger of turning into excuses for sin. You go to a wedding, you know, and a wedding is supposed to be something very beautiful. A man and a woman are pledging, you know, their, their lives to one another in marriage. And then the feast begins, and the bar opens. And what was a beautiful and noble thing, you know, it's not anymore because what happens is after the bar is open, man A is eyeing woman B that's not his wife. 
So let's be careful what we don't. Let's be careful that we don't use Christmas as an occasion or an excuse to act in an on an unchristian way. To me, that would be the height of insult to God to use something that's supposed to celebrate his son as a cover for iniquity. And if you're feeling guilty about it, I'm cool with that. Because I don't want to get to heaven and the Lord looks at me and says, hey, why didn't you... So let's not use the holiday to celebrate his son as a cover for iniquity. And my last suggestion, right, let's make sure that we as Christians make an honest effort to restore the true spirit of Christ at Christmas time. You know, when Christmas began, it was done with the purpose of Christianizing a pagan society. All of the symbols and all of the practices were changed, and they were recast, right, in order to teach and to glorify Christ. A pagan practice that I mentioned before was the giving of the gifts to the gods in order to win their favor. You guys remember me talking about that? This was changed by the Christians of the era to the giving of gifts to the poor. It didn't start off with, you know, a husband and wife and parents to children. That's not how it started off. It didn't start off as you buy Christmas presents for your family first. Woo! Christians gave gifts to the poor in order to reflect the spirit of Christ. Who gave his life for many who came to serve and not to be served, and who said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so this tradition that has been commercialized to the point where we almost exclusively use Christmas to give and receive presents between ourselves and our friends and occasionally those who serve us in some way, as Christians we should restore and return to the original purpose of Christmas. And that is to honor Christ and bless others in his name. I keep saying, I want this to be a missional church, not an attractional church. You know, I said it before that there's a relationship between how you feel and what you do at Christmas. For example, if you honor Christ with obedience, you will feel at peace with God and yourself, not only at Christmas, but every day of the year. Sin, you know, is always a burden. It's always a burden. All the time, it's a burden. And disobedience towards God, whether it be missing church, Or refusing to be baptized? Or cheating on an exam? Or lying to your spouse? And shame and discouragement? If you have dishonored Christ by disobeying and wish to be right with God, well then do that. So that you can honestly feel the peace and the joy today. Tomorrow, this Christmas, and every Christmas until Jesus comes again. You know, the sad thing is that the world exalts itself at Christmas time to get just a little, just a little aroma of Christ. It's that aroma of Christ that gives them that feeling of happiness at Christmas time because they get just a little aroma of what is possible. When Christ is, is first and foremost the focus of your attention. They just get a whiff, a whiff of Christ. 
and look how, whoa, you know, <laughs> let's, let's be happy. And people are feeling good, just the small aroma of him. But Christians, <laughs> we can taste him and feel him and breathe him in fully every single day. What the world is searching for and gets a little whiff at Christmas time for a moment, we have access to 365 days a year. Because we can be in the spirit of not Christmas, we can be in the spirit of Christ all the time, morning, noon, and night. We don't need a tree. We don't need colored lights. We don't need presents. And how do we do that? How do we do that? As Christians, we keep our minds and our hearts and our conscience right with God. And we do that, we have to do and stay right with him. And the reward, the present for that, peace of mind, joy, true hope, true love for God. The more I obey God, the more I love him. The more I obey my God, the more I love him. You understand what I'm saying? Obeying God does not breed fear, brothers and sisters. Obeying God breeds joy. I love him so much, the only thing that stops me is my own sinfulness to love him even more. That's the only thing that stops me from getting closer to my God. And then my final encouragement is for those who want to restore the true spirit of Christ to Christmas this year, right? If you want to make an effort to do that, before we purchase all the gifts or stock up on food and goodies for ourselves, nothing wrong with that. Let me get that out there. There's nothing wrong with that. But before we do all that, before we purchase all the gifts, we have to first, but, but, let's give the first portion of our Christmas celebration to the widows. Let's give our first portion of our Christmas celebration to the, boor, to the poor of our church and our community. Before the eggnog, before the celebrations, before all that occurs, before you get all holiday spirited, let's give the first portion to the poor. Let's offer to God our Christmas celebration by giving the very first thing to the poor and the needy. Instead of that being like an afterthought, right? When we're in the middle of, you know, giving our credit card and beating there, buying stuff for everyone, let's sit down and say, okay, okay, who am I going to give that really needs something? Just like it was done in the very first place many centuries ago. If we do that, several things are going to happen. I promise you. Several things are going to happen if you do that. First, we'll truly honor God with this feast. Why? Because the very first portion of our giving will go not to him and the collection plate. It will go to someone who is needful. And that's pleasing to God. We will build up the body of Christ in the community. I want to be a missional church. What does that mean? We got to get to the community. If you're not fishing, you're not following. If you're not fishing, you're not following. And if you're not following, that's another sermon. Doing so will bless those who are less fortunate. 
and, we'll, and we will begin a good work that others can build upon and continue, right, after we're gone. We'll, we will recapture the feeling of love and joy and peace that Christmas is all about. And we can do this in a variety of ways. But I have to make a parenthetical statement here. Because sometimes this idea that I'm, you know, proposing gets confused. I'm not saying the money that you're going to take to the Sunday of Christmas this year is on Christmas Eve. That offering money that you give in the plate instead of giving in the plate, take that money and give it to the Red Cross, <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is once you have done that, which is what we're supposed to do, the first portion to the Lord because it's Christmas. The next portion should be taken to give to someone who needs something. I'm guilty. I'm not a saint. But we put our offering, and at Christmas time, before you do any of your gifts for your loved ones, let's see what the needy need first. And I'm not talking about your kids who want a new Nintendo game or your husband who'd like a new rifle or something. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the next portion. How about filling a bag or two of groceries for a needy family through Illumination or another organization? Or you can select a family in this congregation that you know that can use some help. Or you can give to your favorite charity, a homeless mission, cancer research. It doesn't matter. Let's give that next portion to somebody else. These and other ways will be your personal statement and your personal witness that Christmas, above all else, should honor Jesus Christ. And there is no better way to do this than to be helping and giving to those who are in need and doing it in his name. Try that this year. Try it. And I'll leave you with this. In all things, I gave you an example that so laboring, you ought to help the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Father God, oh, Lord, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry that a lot of times the stuff that I preach about, I don't personally follow myself. I'm sorry. Help me get closer to you, Lord. Help me have the heart of Jesus. Let me have the Christ, the, the mind of Christ. Don't let my selfishness and my sinfulness get in the way of my relationship with Jesus, Father. Let me be an example to the flock that you entrusted me with, Father God. As we celebrate you, Lord, this season, just help us to honor you. Help us to celebrate Christ. Help us to, to help others that are in need before putting our selfish needs first. Lord, one of the things that I've always said since I, since I got appointed to be the next lead pastor is Tom Rivera cannot lead this church. If Tom Rivera leads this church, it is done. Lord, allow me to open up and surrender everything to allow you to lead your church through me. Because if you lead your church through me, <laughs> all, all is well. Be with the congregation as they go out. Help them not forget the words that you spoke through me, Lord. And help them understand the true meaning of this holiday. For it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. God bless you guys.
为。